you wished upon a star. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. Disneyland. Just go to Action Park, there's no other park like it. Six Flags Great Adventure. It's not a world away. Paramount's Kings Island. We will officially open Universal Studios Florida. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. Now, here is your host. Hi, my name is Kevin Perger, and welcome back to the Defunct Land Podcast. Today, we are going to be doing a post-episode discussion on the Alfred Hitchcock attraction that was at Universal Studios Florida. And joining me today is Ty Andreco. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, you hit it. Yes, I did. I was even given explicit instructions, and I still was worried that I was going to mess it up. That's how bad I am at pronouncing names. Um, But you have done a lot in the theme park industry as far as being a a cast member at Disney, and one of your favorite attractions at Universal was the Alfred Hitchcock Experience. That's correct. Um, So we're going to talk about a lot of Disney on this Universal podcast, so sorry, Universal fans, but because we have Ty here and he knows a lot... um, about Disney and some of aspects that we have never talked about on the podcast before. We're going to dive into that a little bit before we get into Universal Studios. So, um, Ty, you worked on as a Jungle Cruise skipper from 2007 to 2008. That's correct. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me uh, what that entailed, and I'll probably ask some specific questions, because this is one of the most coveted positions at the Disney parks, as being a Jungle Cruise skipper. Well, I sort of lucked into it. I went down to interview after uh, after vocational school. So it was like right out of high school, about 16 months after that, I went down to Disney to interview. And um, just between uh, speaking with somebody at casting, I guess they saw the enthusiasm and uh, that particular uh, or that particular cast member asked me what I'd like to do. And I said the Haunted Mansion. And apparently at the time it was full. And uh, she said, well, I can get you in uh, everything's acronyms uh, in Disney. She said, I can get you into AdLib, which is eventually in Liberty Square. And she said you could cross train into the Haunted Mansion. Well, uh, as it turns out, that was luck and, and serendipitous because had I ended up in the Haunted Mansion, I probably wouldn't have lasted a week. Um, it was being able to interact the way that I could on the Jungle Cruise that kept me there for um, – for the amount of time that I was there. I never did cross train into anything else besides the Jungle Cruise. And do you think uh, you would have you would have been bored doing the other jobs and the Jungle Cruise was just more engaging? I- exactly. Um, you know, there I had friends that cross trained into uh, into everything that you could in ad lib. That would be like Hall of Presidents, um, the Magic Carpets of Aladdin, you know, Pirates. These were n- <laughs> these were boring positions. I mean, that you you really can't get more boring than spending an entire day telling you know people to you know this is the fast pass lane this is the standby lane you know right especially the magic carpets of Aladdin that that would oh, be the worst yeah I had to work I had to work greeter there occasionally um, when we were understaffed um, and just stand out front and you weren't really exactly working the attraction you were just directing people. Um, but yeah, gre- greeter was was a common position that you could get moved from place to place, um, even within your Jungle Cruise attire, which really didn't fit the other attractions at all. Well, that's not normal for Disney. No, no. And so uh, you you get the job at the Jungle Cruise, um, and you go ahead and uh, you train. I'm I'm assuming. Oh yeah, it's intensive training. You start with uh, traditions, which I think is general for. For every employee, traditions is um, like a history of the company, um, explaining some of the ideals, what sets Disney apart uh, as a um, you know as a as a vacation destination, and and those types of things. And then depending on what your role is going to be, uh, from that maybe eight hour day, you'll transfer to more specific to what you're going to do now um i i'm not very familiar with what they with what they do outside of um working in the theme parks but i got moved to magic kingdom general training which is you work uh 
parade audience control one day. Let's you go set up the ropes um, at, for the three o'clock parade, and uh, you get taken on. You get backdoored, uh, which means you know you get to skip the line and ride a few rides. And it's really them, uh, I think, almost doing their indoctrination, you know, to a certain degree. Um, and then from there, I think I did about two weeks of actual jungle cruise training before I had to check out, which is the most nerve wracking thing. Um, you get your first group of actual guests on the boat and you have to spiel for them in front of your, uh, in front of your trainer. And it is, uh, it's intense, but by the, um, it's funny as nervous as I was, and I can remember my trainer, my, my leg was shaking so bad that my trainer put his foot on top of my foot to keep my leg from shaking. But uh, as as you know, as nervous as I was after I checked out, they let me go with just guests on the boat, and it was just me and guests. And I'd say by my third time around, I became extremely comfortable with it. I knew that that was my place in Disney. And so you ha- you every Jungle Cruise has a generic script, or it has multiple scripts that you can pull from, or did you um, have a certain amount of things you had to say? What what was the process of learning the spiel like? If you, uh, to check out, you basically had to stick to script almost entirely. It's pretty well scripted. I don't, I don't remember there being a whole lot of variations on, on jokes you could do. Um, but yeah, to check out, there was a definite, you know, you had to stick to it script. Um, however, and this is probably an industry secret, I guess, um, we were permitted to ad lib, uh, to, you know, improvise, provided it was two things were very important. It was Disney appropriate, of course. And the other was that it pertained to the jungle. Um, you couldn't make pop culture references because it's supposed to be a, you know, a period that you're depicting. Uh, neither rule I ever followed, but, uh, <laughs> wait, so, so you would do something that was, uh, specific to outside of the jungle and Disney inappropriate. Yeah, I did. Uh, I mean, not extremely inappropriate, but like I did jokes like um, when the when the natives pop up, you know, with the with the spears, I'd say, watch out for those spears. They're from the famous Britney tribe. They don't have hair, <laughs> nor do they have justifiable custody of their children. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Things like that. Um, I had and this. Well, this was in 2007 and 2008. So that was a much more. Um, oh, yeah, that was that was way more relevant. That was right about the time she had her nervous breakdown. But she was also a Disney, you know, child star. So it didn't seem completely out of the realm. Well, um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. And uh, are you familiar with uh, WDWmagic.com? Yes. I, know, I don't want to plug anybody else, but uh, yeah, back no one the... go to them. This is my site. Well, yeah. I'm just go, go wherever you want. <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, if you search the name I went under, which was Tetanus Shot Thai, Tetanus Shot Thai in Google, one of the, actually the first pop-up will be a WDW Magic forum where somebody was commenting on my After Hours Jungle Cruise. Uh, The After Hours Jungle Cruise where the jokes are twice as suggestive and therefore take twice as long to explain to your children. None of it was really inappropriate. That's just the way I started it off. I usually did that in the evenings, especially I guess we had extra magic hours back then. We were out of um, we weren't doing e-ride nights at that point. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you used to be able to pay if you were a resort guest, you used to be able to pay twenty dollars extra to stay in the Magic Kingdom till like 1 a.m. And then they switch to extra magic hours and after hours parties and things like that. Yeah. So th- that actually brings up more questions than it answered. With tetanus shot, did you have you received a tetanus shot? Do you give tetanus shots? What's okay, that? that came from a Snopes two article that <laughs> I read a long time ago, long before I ever worked at Disney. That I um, they had a very specific Disney theme park section, which was very interesting. And uh, one of the things I read on there, I still don't know if it's true to this day, even after working there, was that if you fell in the Jungle Cruise water and your head went under the water, that you had to get a tetanus shot. I don't know if that's true, but that's just where I came up with the name. And then um, it was it was interesting because I couldn't tell people that uh, I couldn't tell guests that certainly not. So whenever they would ask, like, you know, where'd you get a name like tetanus shot? Ty? I'd say, well, uh, I just wanted a name that invoked fear into children. 
Um, what was your favorite pun and what was your least favorite pun that you had to say? Uh, let's see. Um, my favorite, my favorite pun was, uh, at, at the, at the original ending, they now call him trader Sam, but the head hunter, you know, you'd make terrible jokes about like, uh, you know, he's the head salesman in the jungle. Um, but you know, you know, they were, my favorite was chief. We called him chief Nami. They call him trader Sam, but I, my favorite was chief Nami has the only coffee available on the Mekong river. It's, uh, it's available in regular and decapitated. <laughs> Nice. Uh, that was my favorite, I think. And my least favorite, uh, my least favorite was heading into the temple. There was never a good joke for that. I mean, you could do that's, you know, that's the, that's the goddess Shirley and this is Shirley's temple. Or you could do, those are the, they had like the way the ruins fell, they kind of look like monorail tracks. And you'd say like, that's Disney's first attempt at a monorail. But yeah, like none of them were very good. I usually just sang the, uh, I'd usually just go in singing the, um, the Gene Wilder, Willy Wonka song. Like when he goes through the tunnel, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> the, uh, the, <laughs> wow. That, that must've been, that would've been terrifying. Um, but that, that, that's really funny. Um, well, let's see. Yes, Jungle Cruise, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Did you weren't allowed to make pop culture references? So I, I guess the Britney Spears would have been your only topical two thousand seven, two thousand eight reference. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't have too many other ones. And this was um, before the Jingle Cruise. Oh yeah, well, well before the Jingle Cruise, yeah. And so has the Jungle Cruise. Is the Jungle Cruise now your favorite attraction at the Magic Kingdom? I mean, it's always going to hold a special place in my heart. I know, uh, well, yes, but as far as fa- I mean, it sounded like the Haunted Mansion was one of your favorite because that's where you wanted ha- to work. Yeah, Haunted Mansion's always going to be my favorite. I think even it's okay. So Haunted Mansion's my favorite to experience as a guest. The Jungle Cruise, uh, you know, was the only ride I would have ever been suited to work, you know, on. You could have done the great movie ride. They had to stick to a script. You're not allowed to improvise. Oh, I guess I never did get around to explaining that. Um, the Jungle Cruise, you were allowed to improvise. And the the reason for that was not to – well, I mean, I guess to some degree it was to keep the ride fresh and relevant. But more so, if you as a Disney employee are required to stick specifically to your script, um, that is to say if you are – great movie ride which is gone now or probably kilimanjaro safari uh they have to pay you more an hour oh wait what oh okay so it's like a it's a contract it's a contract dispute kind of thing yeah yeah if you have to stick specifically without any kind of improvisation or deviation they have to pay you more an hour or at least that was you know it's almost a decade ago now but or it is a decade ago now but um that's how it was when I was saying. Right, because it would have been maybe you were now a performer and not a cast member or some, something of that sort. Like you're not a exactly. You weren't quite equity, which is the. Um, I guess you started to fall under equity. Is like the the actual actors union, like the people you see on Main Street, uh, the care, you know, the um, the townspeople on Main Street, the uh, the sh- street atmosphere type people you used to see in Disney Studios. I don't know how much around, you know, how much they are around anymore but these are actual actors uh they are in the actors union which is called equity so i guess you'd probably start to fall under their union versus ride operators or whatever our union was it doesn't matter it was weak as hell (laughs) there wasn't any strikes you didn't go on any ride operator strikes no there was con there was one contract dispute while i was there and i can remember um, like literature going around that said, you know, vote no to this contract, vote no to this contract. And then we did. And by the time it came back up again, it was the same contract and there was literature going around saying vote yes. So I don't, it was just weak. I mean, nobody, nobody sees that on the front. It doesn't matter to anybody on the front, but I come from Pittsburgh, you know, we're a union area. So like the steel industry and everything. So yeah, I, you know, I could see the weakness within you you saw past the union the union guys and you knew you knew what your your people needed i guess because all i the only the only reason i even voted on it was because we got to go to the contemporary like we got to take off like maybe 20 to 30 minutes and go over to the contemporary and in the one of their convention halls we got to vote 
Oh my, I, th- I thought you meant they gave you a, like a, a room in the Contemporary if you voted yes on it. I was like, wow, that is some oh, shady no, no, dealing, no. Disney. Um, so I, guess, I think my last question on the Jungle Cruise is going to be, uh, so you had to deal probably with a lot of children on the ride. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So uh, what children? What child did you most? What child story? I guess did you most want to hug the child, and what child story did you most want to punch the child? And it's it's gonna sound so lame, but um, I was working greeter outside of the Jungle Cruise one time, and there was a uh, you know you learn they teach you how to speak to children. Number one, I'm very tall, so I always stoop to speak to children because when you tower over them and talk over them, it's it's you know, disturbing to them. But I remember I was working greeter out in front of the Jungle Cruise and there was this little girl and she had a beautiful princess dress on, certainly nothing you would buy in the, uh, uh, in the gift shops. I mean, it was very well made, just looked gorgeous. It was created by our animals. What's that? Was it created by animals? No, no, it's a princess dress. Right. But most princess dresses in the movies are created by animals. No, this, well, okay, we'll get to that then. I know. I um, so I I stooped down to talk to this little girl and I, I said, "Wow, your your dress is so you know your dress is so beautiful. Uh, did a fairy godmother make it for you?" And she looked up at her mother and she said, "Yes." <laughs> and um, the that was you know heartwarming in itself. But at the time, Spectro Magic was the parade. I don't know if you're familiar with, it. Mm-hmm. but uh, there was a there was a tune in it that um that I, I just couldn't remember. And I could tell this little girl was like, you know, fascinated with Disney princesses. So I said, Hey, I, um, I said, you know, I've been listening to this parade at night and I keep hearing this song and I can't think of the words to it. And I started to hum it. I was like, do you know it? And I started to hum it for her. And then her mother stooped down next to her and they sang someday my prince will come to me. And, uh, I got a little choke. I did. Oh, that's sweet. Um, and, and to, and to this day, when I see a cast member stoop down to talk to a, talk to a child, you know I, that that hits me down in the feels. You know. Yeah, that's so that's so nice. Now, what child did you want to punch? No, I've seen I've seen kids pee off the boat. What? What? So you saw kids pee on the boat, like pee themselves on the boat, or pee and now the pee is on the off the boat. boat. Like their parents, like they gotta go, and their parents ain't gonna let them piss themselves. Kids my peed language. off the boat. Yeah, I've seen that. I've no seen a girl. Fl- that, you've never. That's yeah. really. Yeah, that happens. Maybe that's why you got to get a tetanus shot when you go into the water. It's probably the dye they use. I don't. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. It's well, actually when they first introduced the dye, it's actually purple, not brown, like most people see. Well, that's all I have for the Jungle Cruise. Um, I'm glad that I, I've never had to had the opportunity to talk to a skipper before, so it's been nice. Uh, thank you for sharing some of your stories. Um, and so now we can get on to a little bit about Universal Studios. Um, tell me about your experience with the park. Um, just how many, when you first went, how many times you've gone, stuff such as that. Okay. So Universal, my first time was probably either 1993 or 1994. I will, I know for a fact I was in second grade, but I'm not sure exactly what year it was. That was my family's first trip to, um, Orlando. We did everything. We did Disney and we did Universal. And uh, I think at the time I was I thought I was a little bit more edgy than Disney. So I than the like what Disney had to offer. So I remember enjoying Universal quite a bit more uh, with attractions like Confrontation and and the Jaws attraction. And, um, it just seemed a little bit more to my my particular taste at that age, or at least what I thought I liked. Um so that was that was my first trip and um didn't go back again until the early 2000s and uh when i did i just i it didn't matter if it was disney or universal i just fell in love with like theme park engineering and you know trying to figure out how they did all of the the effects and and uh i was very fortunate to return to universal at a time when they were it was prior to them phasing out the original attractions for um, more relevant properties. So I got to experience a lot of these attractions that I had, 
that I had that I that I enjoy I had enjoyed as a child and I had seen in all of those promos for so many years and I got to see them again and and they were really there and they were larger than life and, you know I think that was also kind of the, that was another big part of the difference between how I felt about Disney and how I felt about Universal was you know Disney wasn't a or excuse me Universal wasn't afraid to scare you you know they were they were willing to they weren't your family theme park in the sense that Disney was. Right. Well, this was in 19, you said, what, what, what was it again? What was the, the year? first, the first trip would have been 1993 or 94. Well, man, you were going to Dis- you were going to universal and thinking, wow, this isn't, uh, this is scarier than Disney at the same time that Disney was releasing their scariest attraction of all time, uh, extraterrestrial. And so yeah, it, it wasn't there yet. It was, uh, under construction that year that I went. Right, so that's so the 1994 Tomorrowland expansion would have brought about some more adult probably reacting to the same um, sentiments you expressed as a child, thinking, uh, well, I'd rather go to Universal because it has more adult-oriented attractions, and Disney was trying to catch up a bit, even though Universal was, what, open for three years at that time? Mm-hmm. So, and one of the attractions that you went on was Alfred Hitchcock, The Magic of Making Movies, the attraction that I just did an episode on. So can you tell me a little bit about um, the first time you went on this attraction? Yeah, I, I remember it vividly for a couple of different reasons. Number one, I, even at that young of an age, I was a huge horror fan. I don't know how familiar I was with Hitchcock, but I knew I was walking in or Even if my parents prompt, you know, prepped me for it. I knew I was walking into somewhat of a horror experience. Um, but the, th- <laughs> the thing that sticks out in my mind the most now is I can remember standing in the queue line, which was down the front of the attraction. It probably wound in more, but at that point we were down the front, like on that street. And there was a gentleman walking alongside the line and he was, he had his his head down. He was a universal employee, but he had his head down and he was looking and he was looking. And eventually he stopped at my family and he said, would you guys like to be involved in the, uh, in the show? You get to skip the line. And, you know, of course my dad was like, yes, definitely. Uh, as it turned out, um, the reason we got selected was because my dad was wearing, uh, similar shoes to a cast member in the show, which will come into play later and uh i guess a similar height Uh, my dad's a very tall man and so am i um so we got to skip the line and we went right to the front and uh and and the magic began okay so in the original version you uh i guess you had a small introduction and then you were ushered into a theater to watch a i believe it was like nine minute video um highlighting uh, the Hitchcock films, uh, you know, going from things like Psycho to Rear Window to Vertigo, um, just you know, hitting on all the all the major films, and then um, towards the end of the video, you were prompted to put on your 3D glasses that you picked up on the way into the theater, and at this point, it was to watch a scene from Dial M for Murder, actually the almost murder in dial m for murder which was actually a 3d film um at its at the time when it was released uh it was kind of gimmicky for hitchcock i don't know exactly who pressured him into it and if you watch it to this day he didn't do 3d gimmicks in it at all it was just things in the foreground would obviously pop you know like a desk or a purse or things like that there certainly didn't use it like uh, like somebody like William Castle might use it or, or other filmmakers of the time. At any rate, at the end of that scene from Dial M for Murder, the, you would hear the projector click um, as if something was going wrong and the screen would start to appear as if it was moving towards you. Uh, I believe you started to hear the, the audible sound of like a flock of birds and then the screen would... Uh, begin to tear at which point um, you know you'd start to see behind the screen as if there was like a sound stage there um, and uh, there would just be this flock of birds attacking coming out towards the audience uh, you know like I said it was supposed to be like a sound stage so like lighting rigs and 
and um, and vents and things would would fall towards the audience and eventually um, there'd be sparks and those sparks would uh, appear on the screen and the background would fade and it would just be this single bird or I think it was even the shadow of a bird and it would turn into Hitchcock's famous silhouette and then that was the end of that segment of the show. Next was the Bates Motel, and, well, scaled down, and, and the Bates Mansion. And uh, this is where it got kind of interesting for me being that young and as an audience member. Uh, we hadn't been with my dad up to that point. And um, so they, they, you know, Universal was pitched as, as, a, as a working studio at the time. And uh, so the the gimmick, I guess, or, or whatever you want to call it for the show was that, you know, they were going to show you how movies were made. So the um, I guess they had like a like a small video with Anthony Perkins, who played Norman Bates. And uh, and then they would. I think they brought my dad out at that point, dressed in a dress, which was hilarious. And uh uh, as Norman Bates uh, or mother, as you want to, whatever way you want to look at it. And then they, they would demonstrate how they filmed the, the shower scene, uh, explaining that, you know, the shower was actually had breakaway walls, and how many cameras were involved and how many camera angles so that, um, you know, so, so as to achieve the, the appearance of, uh, of gore and, and things of that nature when you really never did see anything, which was all very interesting. And I, and I think, you know, to a certain degree accurate at any rate, um, this is where it got interesting to an even further degree, because at, at a certain point, uh, they switched out my dad's character or they switched out my dad and, and, and put in an actual actor and there was a voiceover, you know, saying something about like, you know, revealing our secrets and it was mother's voice from, from psycho. And, uh, I remember the, the gentleman, the, the, the act, the actor on stage that was, um, you know, uh, directing the scene, you know, who was explaining everything to you. I remember him, you know, addressing my father and being like, you know, George, what are you doing? And, and then, you know, f for all we knew, my dad like whipped the knife at this guy and it appeared like next to him on the, uh, on one of the posts in the, um, in the, in the, in the motel scene in the motel facade. And, uh, you know, all this, you know, chaos and, you know, and I thought my dad had gone nuts. And as it turned out, uh, you know, it was an actor and there was a switcheroo at the very last moment and they pulled the shower curtain back and there was my dad and then the other gentleman pulled off of his mask and he was revealed as, you know, the character that introduced you, you know, to the attraction at the beginning. It was all very interesting. It's actually highlighted very briefly in a uh, John Forsyth video, uh, not my dad's particular scene, but they never do explain everything they just say oh at the end it's the old switcheroo but when you actually saw the show and i have not found a video on youtube it was very convincing that the gentleman that had just been brought out as a as an audience participant had just gone nuts you know and uh threw a knife at the at the uh at the host of the show it was it was very interesting and, and very compelling but uh like i said it uh you know, as a child watching it, it was it was disturbing. Um, but yeah, I, I, the reason I, I uh, pointed out the fact that the gentleman was looking at looking down as he was picking an audience member out of the uh, out of the queue line was I'm not sure that was something they did every single show. Uh, it may have been, but uh, they picked my dad because of the shoes he was wearing were similar to the shoes that the cast member was wearing or the employee was wearing and um and probably his height and yeah i just you know i i remember that's what got us to the front of the line but it was it was more than that it was it was it was fun to watch you know um from there you got moved into what could what really was like almost an epcot uh caliper um uh, pavilion with with a lot of different things you could do um I think they had a carousel 
from a film called uh, Strangers on a on a Train. I think that was the name of the movie. Positive, but I um they did like rear projection where it would look like you were uh, going real fast on this carousel, and uh, they had binoculars that you could look through onto the uh, the rear window set. They had uh, they had a blue screen. Now I don't know. Yeah, they had a blue screen where you would hold on to the edge of the, the Statue of Liberty and uh, you were sit- you were seated in a chair and you would hold on to the edge of uh, the Statue of Liberty and they told you to, you would push off of it and, uh, you know, flail your arms and the, the actual arm or the piece of the Statue of Liberty that you were holding on to would go towards the ceiling and then you were able to watch a video of, they would insert the, um, you know, the 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 ground below the Statue of Liberty behind you and it would look like you were flailing towards the ground, you know, all just because of where the camera was mounted and how the 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 piece of the Statue of Liberty moved. Yeah, it was it was very interesting. And so then they would they made some changes and you you went after the changes as well, you said. Yeah, they seriously limited the show in the Bates Motel scene. Um, by the time, I guess it would have been like probably 2001 or 2000, you were pretty much ushered through that auditorium, that piece of the show. They would, you would move in, sit down, they would open up the, the shower scene, um, room. They had no actress involved, which they used to, um, they would just show you how the walls broke away and how they got the camera angles. And you basically sat down almost in the same moment that you stood up and went on to the, the pavilion area. And so, um, so that was probably disappointing having such a great experience the first time and then realizing that they had cut pretty much the entire scene. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was obvious even then that it had, I mean, not for someone like me, but for the, for the, general audience i think not many people were exactly f- f- like astonished with hitchcock anymore um yeah you know and there was you know there there was the bates there was an actual bates motel set at universal for some time universal florida um not a lot of people realize that i guess but they filmed i think the fourth movie in the series at uh, Universal Studios Florida, you know, at a time when they were touting, so they had a full scale set of the motel. Right, and that's the, a, uh, yeah, they had a Beetlejuice's Graveyard Tours there, which was the show, or the, which was the show that Ron Schneider, a former podcast guest that we had on again this season, um, wrote, and we talked about talked about that. So they used it for that, and yes, they did film that movie there. Yeah. So, but but by ninety eight, that was gone. You know, people didn't. I don't know, people didn't appreciate Hitchcock quite the same way they they did at one time, I guess. Who's to say? I just when I was researching this, I never did click on the link, but uh, there was a link that said, "Will there be a Hitchcock attraction again in Universal?" So who knows? I'm not the hugest Hitchcock fan. I'm not like I don't dislike him. I've seen Rear Window, and I've seen some of his shorts actually. Um, and he's, he's, you know, one of the best filmmakers of all time, but it is a little dry now in the modern age to watch some of those old films, which is, which is sad considering he was the building blocks for cinema, but going back and actually sitting through some of these movies, it is, it can be tedious at times. Um, yeah. He's not, he's not Vin Diesel, I guess. Yeah. He's not Vin Diesel. I was just about to say he's that. Not as, <laughs> yeah. He's not as charismatic as Dave Bautista or the rock or any of the other, uh, muscle men, um, no, it's uh, yeah, no, it's interesting to have such a quaint, um, slow build filmmaker be the star of an attraction at Universal Studios. I can never see that being there now, um, with all the you know everything's action packed. You got Transformers, and you have uh, I guess Shrek 4D is a bad example. So is Dudley Do Right. Okay, maybe there's a lot of weird stuff there, but you know what I mean. The it's very yeah, uh, yeah. action oriented. Um, but yeah, yeah, they're not gonna they're not gonna green light slow burn <laughs> right exactly it's a it's a very slow attraction um and they got rid of the disaster which was a bit of a slow burn attraction as well it took about 30 minutes to get through there if i remember correctly 
Um, mm-hmm. And so a lot of those old attractions that actually showed showed you how movies were made are are gone. And um, but which is which is interesting because the same thing happened with Disney MGM now Hollywood Studios, but Universal Studios really never advertised themselves as see how the movies were made. Um, they had the back, what was it called? The, the, the front of the park, which was the studios. And, you know, you mm-hmm. had, um, you had the fantastic world there and you got to see how animation was made and you had, um, uh, Hitchcock and you had Nickelodeon studios near there. But then once you went on, it was, you know, ride the movies. This isn't how King Kong was made. This is King Kong. Um, so, uh, they've, they've completely changed that. Now you have, um, Shrek 4d. Have you, have you been on Shrek 4d? Oh yeah. Oh, it's, fine. yeah, it's fine. It's whatever. It's okay. You know. I, I can't believe it's still there. <laughs> that that's what boggles my mind. Um, I'm surprised they haven't taken it out and replaced it with anything else. I'm surprised it's not like Boss Baby 4D. Yeah. Or, well, I mean, Oscar nom Oscar nominated. Uh, at the time of recording, this is just Oscar nominated. Who knows? It might win. It won't, but it might. Um, Oscar nominated Boss Baby in 4D. You know, I, I'm surprised that Shrek is still there, but who knows? They might try be trying to milk that into a fifth movie in the future. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what possesses them to keep certain things and get rid of others. I mean, obviously, like any person that's nostalgic for the early 90s um, of the, of Orlando theme parks, like when when Jaws, when Jaws bowed out for Harry Potter, I. I almost lost my mind. I mean, I it it, it almost felt like as if I I think I felt the same way as if Disney would have taken out the haunted mansion. You know, there's just certain things you can't touch. Right, and well, yeah. Tell me, tell me about it seriously. That's yeah, that's I'm, what, that's, yeah. Obviously, the basis. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're preaching to the choir here, man. The um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's odd. Um, but they've decided to keep uh, Men in Black Alien Attack. Holy cow, that attraction. If you want to go ride an actual defunct line attraction, go ride that ride. Uh, mm-hmm. I went uh, a couple of months ago, and it is a ghost town in there. You, there's still a line, and there's still, you know, it's still operating, but, you know, it's a barren, dark ride. It just it feels like it's already closed, even though pe- there's, you know, sometimes really long waits for it. It's, it's amazing to me um, that they kept that one for so long. Um, and I'm sure that they're going to get rid of it soon unless they make a Men in Black 4. Uh, you know, everything with them is, oh, they can make another sequel, and then people will remember it again. Um, but they still have, you know, the, I mean, The Mummy still has Brendan Fraser at, in the in one part of it, doesn't it? I haven't been on The Mummy in a while, but I, I would assume he was in the uh, he was in the original ending. I, maybe I that mean... was a Hollywood. I, I forget. But I know that Will Smith, 90s Will Smith, or early 2000s Will Smith, is in Men in Black, Alien Attack. And it it's a very jarring thing to see him. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't see them bringing back Hitchcock anytime soon, which is unfortunate for fans of it. But I think it's understandable, considering the nature of the property and the park as it is now. No, I, I agree. I, I, I mean, I, I, I can't, you know, I'm not happy about it, but I agree. It's not, first of all, Universal will never have the land that Disney has to keep certain things. You know, the, Disney has a lot more land that if they want to build an expansion, they can without necessarily destroying, you know, all their attractions, although they do. Or the nearby neighborhood. Yeah. Like Universal would run into residential areas or business districts. It's, it's really just right there. I mean, there's a high there's a high school behind Universal. <laughs> bulldoze there it, is. bulldoze it. We need to, we need to bring back Hitchcock. Tell those kids to go somewhere else. Doctor Phillips High School. I could. I used to drive past that and wonder, like, can you imagine what it would be like to look out your window and see the show building for Jurassic Park and realize that you have to sit there and do algebra? That's a much <laughs> lower stakes Florida Project film that we need to get on Florida Project Two. It's the kids <laughs> that stay in the high school that are right behind Universal Studios. Ty, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, to everyone listening, he's hopefully going to write an article for defunctline.com, so keep your eye out for that. Uh, so just thank you again for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, to everyone listening, thank you for listening. Um, oh, what is it? Oh, yeah. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Um, and thank you for visiting Defunctland.